Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadhvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadhvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her Guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. Why is Om used everywhere? What is the significance? The significance of Om is actually very, very vast and can be looked at from a lot of different levels. But for right here, for right now, we'll, we'll go into a piece of it. Om is the sound of the universe. And so when you meditate, when you do in-depth pranayama, When you go deeply within, when the sounds of the outer world become still, it's not into a place of emptiness. You know, Puja Swamiji observes a lot of silence. He used to do it for years on end and months on end and Now, rather than doing it like that because of so many programs and projects and so much seva that he does, he brings it into his his day. And so there's silence from 10 at night to 10 in the morning, silence in the afternoons. But I mention this because one of the things that he always shares when people ask about why silence is... Silence is not the absence of sound. It's not a negative space of, okay, here there was sound, you remove the sound, now you have silence. Any more than peace is just the absence of conflict or war. You could stop conflict and war. doesn't mean you're going to have peace. Peace is something much deeper. Silence is something much deeper than just the absence of outer sound. Now, absence of outer sound is a prerequisite for it, just like stopping killing each other is a prerequisite for peace. But it's not the highest that we go. And when you stop the outer sound, and you go into a place of stillness, if you're quiet enough, there is a sound. And the sound is the sound of a home. It's said that this is actually the sound out of which all else was born. And in fact... When you look at the, because it's not, we write it frequently O-M, but it's actually A-U-M. It's actually A-U-M. It's actually three separate sounds. And those three sounds are referred to actually as the three elements of the divine. So we have the creator. We have the sustainer. We have the dissolver, destroyer. And that those three elements include the three aspects of the divine. And so in the sound of Om, 
is the presence of all three elements of the divine. In the A-U, you have G-O-D, generator, operator, dissolver, or destroyer. So this is, this is the, the base for it, but it also is just a very, a very auspicious and, and beautiful sound for people. See, within the Hindu tradition, there's an almost infinite number of different paths and lineages. And so you'll find people worshiping the divine in the form of Krishna and people worshiping the divine in the form of Shiva and people worshiping the divine in the form of the divine mother and on and on into many, many different possibilities. But there's also lineages where they don't worship the divine in form at all. Still within the Hindu or Sanatan Dharm traditions. And in many of them, what they worship is Om. Not a symbol as God. It's not just a symbol of Om instead of an image of Krishna or instead of an image of Shiva or Ram. But it's a nameless, formless, divine presence. Much more like something you would find in a Judeo-Christian tradition. And yet, in that, in that it doesn't take form, in that puja is not done to it, there's no idols. And that divine is worshipped through the symbol of the sound. As I've mentioned in here frequently, the... Hindu tradition is the only tradition I know of that actually has an entire scripture dedicated to sound. There are traditions and lineages rooted in the name of God as the divine. When we say Sat Nam, the name is the truth. And it's not one name. It's not that if that's your tradition, you fight each other to determine which name it is that's true. And yet, if we chose any of the names, inevitably there would be people who would say, oh wait, that's not, that's not the name that works best for me. So when we speak about the name, it frequently is the sound. We use the word name, but it actually is more the sound. The sound is truth. And so Om is that embodiment of the sound, which is truth. And lastly, and again, this is a really, really wide topic, but just lastly for tonight, as we know, sound is energy. Sound is not just something that we hear and we dance along or sing along or bop along or we like it or we don't like it. Sound is actually energy. It's literal vibrations that don't stop vibrating just because they've hit our tympanic membrane in the ear. They vibrate all the way through it. That's what allows us to hear and to know what people are saying. I mean, literally, you are, quote, unquote, hearing what I'm saying due to vibrations, first on the outer ear and then ultimately as it moves into the inner ear along little, little, little microscopic hairs and how those hairs vibrate, whether it's a long frequency or a short frequency. And that gets translated into this brilliant, inconceivably genius contraption called a brain that the universe has given us that somehow takes waves and turns them into words. But they're energy. 
What goes in is energy. What impacts us is energy. You know that very acutely when you sit in places where there's a lot of base. We had a beautiful performance during our international yoga festival by Shiva Maniji, who's the world famous percussionist. And you sit on your couch and you literally vibrate. I mean, he's playing a good 50 feet from you. The speakers are a good 20, 30 feet from you. But literally, you're not just hearing it in your ears. The body is literally vibrating. If you doubt this, sit somewhere and turn on the radio really loud where there's a you know good rock song going on that's got a lot of bass. You feel it in the body. And this is important because when we say that OM is the sound of the universe, it's also therefore the energy of the universe. And so when we drop into it, we chant it loudly, softly, internally, externally, we're literally connecting with the vibration of the universe, the energy of the universe, which is why it's so powerful. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Judgment is something that plagues all of us. And it's tricky because it's not inherently bad. Judgment is actually very useful. You walk up to a stove. It's useful to have the capacity to judge. Is it going to be hot or is it not going to be hot? It's useful to judge. You've got to, you know... Leap over a little chasm. You're going to walking over rocks. There's a little space between the rocks. It's useful to be able to judge, can I make it? Is that an easy leap? Or is that a risky leap? So actually having good judgment is something that we have been evolutionarily programmed for. Presumably our ancestors who could not properly judge whether that was an easy leap or not didn't last very long to pass on their genes. Those who couldn't judge whether the look on that bear's face or tiger's face was friendly or not friendly, friend or foe, didn't last long enough to pass on their genes. So, so the judgment of friend or foe, safe, unsafe, doable, not doable, 
burning hot, not burning hot, is actually good. The place that judgment becomes so difficult is where our judgment gets limited to one aspect of who we are, but we extrapolate into all of who we are. So, I'm carrying a glass, a cup of coffee up the stairs or down the stairs. I misjudge that two steps at once was doable. Turned out it wasn't doable. I trip and spill the coffee. Okay. Not an evolutionary disaster. We're still going to live long enough to pass on our genes. But what happens is the mind goes, you idiot. You're such a klutz. You're so stupid. I mean, really, like you can't even walk up the stairs? And this goes. You can't do anything. Maybe it was a good intention. Maybe you were taking the cup of coffee to someone else. And then the drama goes even deeper. See, even you try to do something good, you can't. Even this do one random act of kindness every day thing isn't going to work for you because, look, you were doing it. Bringing a hot cup of coffee to a colleague who was, you know, up to her shoulders or neck in work. And what do you end up with? Burned with stained clothing. You can't do anything. See, what's happened is the judgment of you as an entirety has now become relegated to your capacity to hold a hot cup of coffee and traverse two steps at once without looking. It's a tough task. Some people could probably do it. Some people couldn't. It has nothing to do with your worthiness as a human being. It has nothing to do with the importance of serving others and being kind. It just ends up hurting us. And so this is where judgment becomes something that we have to really work with. But not in a all judgment is bad. Common sense is very useful. Discrimination is very useful. Truth, not truth. And that's just a form of judgment. Truth, not truth. Healthy, not healthy. Light, dark. Safe, not safe. But when judgment is turned inward first, and then we'll look at outward, it becomes a disease. And this is what we have to work with. And it's just, it's just a pattern. It's a habit. And the good thing is, like any habit, it can be changed. The first thing is to see it. Because almost all of these mind games dissipate the minute you look at them. Ah, jealousy. Wow. Welcome to tea. Haven't seen you in a while. What it does is, we've called it by name, which means it's not me. So we'll go back to our hot tea, our hot coffee example. Ah, internal judgment. Wow, all right, I almost made it two hours without your presence. Okay, judgment, here we are. You call it by its name. You see it. You don't berate it. You don't judge it. Because then, of course, you just wind yourself even deeper. There I am judging myself again. God, I can't even do the spiritual thing right. Forget carrying coffee up two cups of stairs. Can't do anything. So it just becomes yet another excuse to berate ourselves. Wandering mind. Ugh, can't even meditate. Knew I was a useless banker, but really I can't even meditate either. So you just call it by name, ah, okay, judgment. Then 
if you're someone as I am who happens to find psychology fascinating, not as a black hole into which we get and spin around for eternity and never get out, but simply as a, as a path to shed some light on some of why we are like we are. You may want to look at, and if not in that moment, at other times, you may want to look at, huh, all right, where did that come from? Clearly I'm not a worthless human being for spilling a cup of coffee. Where did that come from? And the reason that I recommend that is if we know where it came from, it also dissipates it because that voice comes in like it's the voice of the universe. Really, I mean, all of those voices, they come in like this just booming voice of God. You are the worthless one. And if we can identify it, ah, yeah, I remember. My mom, my dad, my uncle, my teacher, my brother, whatever it was. It gives it that context that makes it no longer the booming voice of the universe. And you just change your habit. So A, I've looked at it, I've named it, which in that moment has dissipated its power. B, at some time in my life, I may be interested in going in psychologically into why I have that. Again, it helps dissipate it. Because then when the voice comes, you can just say, you know, Mrs. Smith, it was really difficult to be in your fourth grade class. I'm no longer in your fourth grade class, and I'm not going to allow your voice to continue to stay in my mind for the rest of my life. I wish you well in your retirement. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can, you can do that. And you'll notice that there's always a little bit of an edge of humor with it. I mean, for me at least. Because I have personally found it works very well. We take ourselves really seriously. We take our problems really seriously. And the more seriously we take them, the heavier they become. And I have found that simply naming it, having a little lightness with it, it doesn't mean that you're undermining it. It doesn't mean that the impact on you didn't matter. It's not deprecating. It's just adding a little bit of lightness to it. Because the minute that there's space for a little giggle, that you've, you've created, you, you've got your foot in the door. And your foot in the door is the first step to getting out of that situation. And then the last piece is you just create different patterns. So when judgment comes, you didn't start judging yourself and others overnight. It was a habit. Maybe your parents, maybe that was what you listened to. Every time you went out with your parents, in the car on the way there, in the car on the way back, all you heard them doing was judging others. My God, did you see what she was wearing? Did you see what he was wearing? Did you see how many pakoras he ate? My God, I mean, is he... We pick it up. Who does he think he is? Who does she think he is? What is she doing with him? My God, he must have a lot of money or something because, you know, this, this type of negative nonsense is what fills up the space in a lot of cars, a lot of dining tables, a lot of tea rooms. And when we're young and really impressionable, this is the, these are the patterns that get laid in our brain. Ah, we judge. Ah, we criticize. And of course, we learn to do it to ourselves first. And then we do it to others. So lay a new new habit. The minute that voice of judgment comes, you look at it, ah, judgment. Choose something different. You've got options. You know, if if you're diabetic, let's say, and you're just diagnosed with diabetes. 
every time in your life that you've gone to the grocery store, you've thrown a pint of ice cream or four into your cart. It's part of your standard grocery list. Hagen does. Well, now you've been diagnosed with diabetes. Habitually, you're going to push that cart right to the ice cream aisle. Habitually, you're going to open the thing. At some point, a voice in your head is going to say, Ah, oh, no. Not if I want to be healthy. And you close the door and you don't put it in the cart and you maneuver the cart to a different aisle. It just takes a while to lay a new pattern. Two years after not putting ice cream in your cart, it's no longer going to go on autopilot over there. You're going to find yourself heading straight to produce. But it takes a while. You've got to lay, this is, you know, in Indian culture we talk about sanskaras. In science, we talk about neural networks, patterns. But it's all the same stuff. It's just habits. So every time a judgment comes, ah, judgment. Not anymore. Just as I don't want diabetes to ruin my physical health, I don't want judgment to ruin my spiritual health. But I've got to take just as much control over what I allow inside my mind as I do what I allow inside my body. We somehow intuitively understand that physically, but not so much spiritually and emotionally. And the last piece of this actually is also really important, which is check who you hang out with. Because even if you're learning not to judge... These patterns, a lot of them are really subconscious. Hang out with people who are judging each other, who are judging themselves. Feel free to say, you know what, I'm on a judgment diet, guys. I'd love to be with you. Would love to hang out. Would anybody mind if we changed the subject? Isn't it a beautiful day? And see. Real friends would not drop you because you got diabetes and stopped eating Hagen does. They'd say, well, that's all right. When you're around, we'll eat carrots. And if they insist on making you eat Hagen does, well, they're not real friends. And in the same way, if they're not able to change their pattern of speech, or they're not willing to, this is when you start looking for a new sangha, a new group that's more supportive of the new patterns that you're laying. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul, every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. So she's asking about love and compassion with all of the poor people and the beggars. And what do you do? What do you do? 
Well, you do as much as you can. There's, there's two levels of existence here. I mean, there's a lot of levels, but there's two we're dealing with. We're dealing with the very physical and the deeply spiritual. So on the deeply spiritual side, you can say, okay, there's a karmic package here. Clearly the law of karma is playing itself out simply because we have faith in the law of karma and faith in the universe. And so that which is happening is there because it's meant to happen. And you are bothered by it because you are meant to be bothered by it. It's not just their karma. The impact it has on you, your tears, your frustration, your anger, your compassion, your wanting to help, is also part of the karmic package. So there's... You know, you hear a lot of people really simplistically say, oh, don't get upset. It's their karma to be poor. Well, it may be. But it's your karma that has led you to feel upset by it. And that upsetness is our catalyst to action. And so it's your karma to have that experience that leads you then to do something for them. So you can't only call half of a situation karma. If we're, if we're looking at it and we're using karma to explain it, that's fine. That is absolutely one very valid way of looking at things. But it only works if you look at the whole picture like that. You can't say it's their karma to be poor, but forget about your karma to help people who are so that's, that's one way of looking at it on, on the physical level is, yes, they're poor. And yes, you feel sad. Yes, you feel frustrated. Yes, something arises in you. Well, if it arises in you, it's there for a reason. And I have, I have a very, very deep faith in in God and in the divine plan that whatever arises in us is there for a purpose. That none of our emotions or even desires or feelings, that nothing is bad. I'm never in favor of suppressing any of it. doesn't mean we act on everything. But everything that arises, arises for a a reason, a purpose, and maybe it's just for us to look and to say, well, that's interesting. Wow, I guess I've got some more work to do with greed than I thought. Not that you then go out and steal somebody's things, but you're able to look at it and say, yeah, okay, there's greed. There's jealousy. There's competitiveness, whatever it is that's arising. And if what's arising is pain for another, compassion. It's arising for a reason not to just be suppressed. So you do what you can. But again, you have to do things wisely. And this is where it becomes difficult. Because unless you happen to be the richest woman in the world or one of them, Unless you happen to have access to a a basically unlimited fund of money, to simply fund into the system of out of your pocket into their hand is not a system that's sustainable. If every single person who follows in your footsteps also gives money, it could be sustainable. I mean, one way to look at it is, well, if everybody just gave them money, then yeah, it, it absolutely could be sustainable forever. But since we know everybody doesn't, the question becomes, if this is what I have, if these are my resources, how can I best use them to help these people and so many people like them? And that answer is different for different people. 
It may be giving them food. It may be donating to a charity that feeds them or houses them or educates them. It may be opening, starting a charity to take care of them and raising money from your friends and coming and doing something. I mean, it, could, it could be anything. But the question is always, how can I get the most impact for the resources that I have? Balancing that, of course, with the very human experience of those who have literally landed in your lap. And so, you know, one way to think about it might be, well, all right, I've got, you know, this much resources. Half of it I'm going to give directly to these people in front of me because I cannot walk by them and give them nothing. So I'm going to take half of what my total resources are and split it amongst these people or help one one day, help another another day. And I'm going to take the other half of my resources and use it toward a more long-term project, whether something that you're personally doing, something another organization is doing, but you're, you're you know, eating the apples on a tree and planting seeds at the same time. Something is for the moment and something is for the long term. But the other level of it, when you talk about giving them Reiki, the other level of it is spiritual. Well, if you don't have money to give them, what can you give them? Well, love, of course. Um, you know, when I, I was sharing this recently, in, in Delhi, when you drive down the road at the stoplights, very, very frequently children will come up to the, to the windows. And I used to give them money until someone explained to me that, A, it's all a mafia, so the kids don't get to keep anything anyway. And B, what you see is the minute you put in one kid's hand, out of nowhere, another huge group of kids come right when the light turns green, and you're going to get someone run over one day. And so I stopped giving to them on the streets, but... For me, what I realized is I cannot pretend they don't exist. And so when they bang on the windows, I will not let myself look away. I literally force myself, and it's not easy, I literally force myself to look in their eyes. At least to see them. To try to connect with a humanity. Because if it is a mafia, and if, as it turns out, they are actually being fed so that they can come out every day and, you know, do this job, well, that's still a really bad situation. I mean, you would be hard-pressed to say which is worse, being hungry enough to actually have to beg or being a child in a mafia being forced to beg. In either case, they're in a dire situation. But in the second case... Being seen as a human is actually something you can give them. And so I do that. And I do it for myself. Because the last thing that I want living in India is to develop an ability to turn my head away from someone who needs help. It becomes very easy to do, and I don't want to develop that ability doesn't mean I'm going to put money in everybody's hands, but I do not want to learn how to look away. So at the bare minimum, see them. If you can send them Reiki, send them love, send them healing, sure. But in general, really what they need, at least the ones you see here, not the one is they need food in their stomach. Um, the majority of the internal healing that they need stems from having to beg on the streets. 
And so give food where you can give food. And when you go back, don't forget them. Because there's all sorts of programs that can be done. It just requires all of us to give whatever we can give in terms of our time. You know, as Pooja Swamiji says, our time, our talent, our technology, our tenacity, whatever you've got. Can you give it? This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. There is a big debate in the U.S. right now about legalizing marijuana. Some people don't use it to become completely intoxicated, but use it just ever so slightly to calm their minds down, reduce anxiety, etc., so that they can then meditate or even just to sleep. Can marijuana be used like this as a natural plant given to us to help, or is any use of it a crutch to us spiritually? Well, this goes back to what we were speaking about last night in terms of using other drugs for spiritual experiences. And as I said last night, you really only got two choices. Either you agree that you're going to spend the rest of your life using drugs, or you learn how to have the experience, whether it's a, a deep spiritual experience, or whether it's the calmness and peace that you need to meditate or to sleep. Either way, either you say, all right, I'm just going to use the drugs forever because they give me the spiritual experience or they calm me down. Or you say, well, at some point I'm going to have to learn to do it without the drugs. And since I'm going to have to learn to do it without the drugs at some point, why not now? I don't know anyone who says I'm better able and more able to meditate now even without marijuana because I used to use marijuana to help me meditate. Or anyone who says my sleep comes much more easily and better to me now even without marijuana because I used to use marijuana to sleep. It doesn't have an effect like that. It impacts you while you take it, like any chemical, like any drug. And so, again, either you say, all right, I like this, I'm going to use this forever, or you say, well, I'm going to use it temporarily, at which point I'm then going to learn how to do it without the drug. And the question becomes, well, then why bother? Why not access your natural ability to be peaceful, to be calm, to have a spiritual experience, 
to fall asleep. Any use of it like that for spiritual practices, anything non-really physical, it is a crutch. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad. I'm not sitting up here as the moral police. A lot of people have a lot of different ways of getting into their spiritual path and practice and you know i don't i don't take the position of of a moral police or a spiritual police if it's working for you and you feel like it's going to be working for you like that forever god bless you you know sure but if if you've got to keep doing something that's not you See, as I was saying last night, the spiritual path is going back to you. You know, you, you read stories and you hear on the news about athletes, you know, Olympic athletes taking steroids or taking other chemicals to make them run faster or develop more muscle or stuff. And because humans in general don't run that fast. I mean, that's why they're Olympic athletes. Humans in general are not that percentage muscle mass. And so it doesn't surprise me that they decide, well, I'm going to need a little bit of chemical help. It's against the law. It's against the rules. When they get found out, they get kicked out. But it doesn't surprise me that it would occur to them, God, you know, I just, I can't make the three-minute mile on my own, but there's this chemical that when I take it, I come close. Okay, if my, if my single goal is to run that fast at any cost, okay. But when your goal is spiritual and the goal is connect with the self, connect with the higher self, connect with the deeper self, the fuller self, why you would want to alter that self in order to connect with it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah, it makes you calm. It's a central nervous system depressant. But so is deep breathing. So is being in love. So is being in nature. And those things take you much more into a a lasting spiritual place, a lasting peace, than the chemicals. Anything with a half-life is going to require more and more and more and more and more. So again, either you just sign an internal agreement that you're going to do this forever, or you might as well figure out how to do it without the chemicals now. That being said, an important footnote to that is there's a lot of research coming out these days about the use of marijuana medically, not spiritually, but medically. And the comparisons between, and interestingly, I don't know all of the biology of it, but there's there's a part of it that works medically, which is different than the part that actually makes you high. And so they're able to extract medical oil that doesn't give the same being high impact. That oil from everything I've heard, is very, very, very powerful and very effective for a whole wide range of physical conditions, medical conditions, possibly even psychological conditions. And I don't have any problem whatsoever with people taking natural herbs for 
physical or medical conditions. Um, Again, as we were talking last night, you know, if you were diabetic and you had to take insulin, well, if you could take an extract from, from a plant that were more natural, why not? If you're suffering excruciating pain from cancer, from a wide variety of other ailments, and instead of taking medicine that ruins your kidneys and ruins your liver and has a whole host of other side effects... You can take an extract from this plant. Why not? So I don't have any any issues at all. I'm actually quite happy that it's been legalized for all of that. I don't have any problem with that at all. I'm just not in favor of utilizing any sort of chemical assistance for spiritual experience because it just becomes too easy to always need it. Or chemical assistance for what really should be our natural state, peace. And yeah, we get angry sometimes, and that's okay. And we get sad sometimes, and that's okay. And we get frustrated sometimes, and that's okay. But what happens is when we, when we develop a chemical crutch, then it becomes so easy because being angry doesn't feel good. Being sad doesn't feel good. Being frustrated doesn't feel good. And if I know that there's this chemical that I can smoke or eat or so, I mean, however I'm taking it, that suddenly makes me not angry that suddenly makes me not frustrated, not sad, I'm much less likely to work with myself psychologically about why am I feeling angry? Why am I feeling sad? Why am I feeling frustrated? And if I don't work with it, what that means is it's just going to keep happening, which means I'm just going to have to keep getting high. And this this is how addictions are built. And whether it's a physiological addiction to needing the chemical or it's just a psychological emotional addiction to needing something to help me deal with my emotions, either way, we get addicted to it. And the point of life is to be free. Our spiritual goal is freedom. And anything that's going to make you stuck and bound and needing something else, whether it's a chemical, whether it's another person to act in a certain way, whether it's a certain amount of money, whatever it may be that you think you need in order to be able to manage your own emotions, it's just going to get you stuck. Even if it's the stuff that's just so common, you, you better act like that or I'm going to get really mad. Well, what does that that mean? You better do what I say or I'm going to get really mad. Well, what I'm saying is I have no control over my emotions. My anger creates such a sense of distress in me that I need you to act in a certain way so that I don't have anger. Well, that's not a very free way to live. That, that ensures I can only live with people, live near people, interact with people who act in ways that don't make me angry. And the whole point is to be free. So anything, anything that's teaching us anything other than to be free is something I would shy away from. And avoid, because ultimately you're going to have to dig in. And so you might as well just start. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday same time on Ohm Times Radio.